So welcome to This Business of Fighting, A Human Face on World War II, presented by Arnie Pritchard. My name is Heather Marquetta, and I'm the Adult Services Director here at STORES. A few years ago, Arnie Pritchard inherited the World War II Army footlocker of his father, Anton Tony Pritchard. It turned out to contain hundreds of letters and other family papers from Tony's service in the Army and in the United Nations Refugee Program in post-war Europe. From these letters, Arnie created a story. This business of fighting focuses on Tony's time in the front lines in Europe. It portrays a young man dealing with everything from raw fear to his role as a leader, to his exposure to a world, to a world both wider and more brutal than he had known. Tony wonders how he will respond to his first combat, describes crawling through the free freezing woods of the Ardennes under enemy fire, and sees crowds of escaping forced laborers wandering the roads of Germany as the Nazi regime collapsed. Arnie Pritchard has a PhD in history from Yale and has been telling stories in public for about 20 years. He lives in New Haven, Connecticut. So welcome Arnie and thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks Heather and thanks to the uh, Storrs Library in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, not in Storrs, Connecticut for hosting this. And uh, thanks to everybody out there for joining us. Uh, as Heather said, you'll be hearing a story which is based on letters from my father's letter from my from my father to his parents in North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, you will not hear everything. This is a partial selection. To use everything would be way too long. So, like all history, this is not the complete story. Uh, the letters have been very lightly edited. Uh, occasionally, I do things like reverse the order of paragraphs or sentences. And on a couple points, I slightly rephrase things just in order to make them more understandable. Uh, but I'm not making an, anything up. And this is history. It is not historical fiction. Uh, you will also be seeing some photos. And the photos are all, all were either found with my father's papers or they were used in the battalion history uh, of his unit, which was written shortly after the war. Excuse me, I just want to make sure of one thing here. Okay, sorry. Uh, now the, the photos do have a relationship to what you will be hearing, but there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. The photos are related to the story, but they do not precisely depict what is happening in the story. So don't waste your energy trying to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. At the beginning of the story, my father has been in the army for a little bit less than two years. He is a second lieutenant, the most junior officer rank in an artillery battalion of the 6th Armored Division stationed at Camp Cook, California. And it is shortly before he goes overseas. He's 26 years old. And before the war, he had worked as a, an assistant in a chemistry lab of a textile company and also in a bank. And one last thing I have to explain is his exact job within the army because it really affects his perspective. He was the reconnaissance officer, also known as the forward observation officer of a battery of artillery. And what that basically means is he was in the front lines in charge of a small team of soldiers. That means he spends a lot of his time in the front lines. And this team that he's in charge of has a radio or a field telephone, and they are telling the big guns, short, which are some distance behind them, where to fire and whether they're hitting their targets and generally what they need to know in order to support the frontline troops. This was a dangerous job, not quite as dangerous as the infantry, but plenty dangerous enough. But the important thing is, although he was technically in the artillery, he had one foot in the infantry and was constantly shuttling back and forth from one to the other. And that accounts for a lot of his perspective. 
So, okay, that is enough um, preliminaries. I'm gonna take a second to set up the slideshow and then the story will begin. Um, okay. December 5th, 1943. Camp Cook, California. Dear Mom and Pop. Friday night, dust laden and somewhat weary, we got back to camp. The test is over. We've had the critique and come Monday morning, we go back to the usual routine. The test went well, I think. We've been rated satisfactory, not as gratifying as an excellent or superior rating, but huh, it's over now. Lieutenant General Simpson, commanding the Fourth Army, of which we are now a part, gave us a hell-raising harangue about not getting better than a satisfactory. He spoke a little in generalities about our chances of seeing action, stating that three to five months would find us on a front. One ought to be able to believe a lieutenant general, oughtn't one? But frankly, I don't think the old goat knows much more about it than me. And if he did, he wouldn't divulge the information anyway. As usual on maneuvers, there were a couple of casualties. A scout car went into a gravel pit in the dark and a man was crushed beneath it. And some poor devil got scattered around Burton Mesa by a shell. This last incident is being blamed on the artillery and things are in a hell of an uproar about it. Much investigating is going on, which will show, I think, that it was a mortar round that fell short. Any thoughts of leave will have to wait until things have settled down a little. After the first of the year, I think, would be a time to take a crack at it. In the meantime, any thoughts of Christmas will just have to go along in a haphazard fashion. Cheers, Anton. February 26th, 1944. Dear Mom and Pop, this is the first letter I've written since leaving the United States. Leaving one's country for the first time produces a sensation difficult of calm description. It's very hard to believe that I'm on board ship leaving America behind at 13 knots. We left port in a blinding snowstorm, a disappointing quirk of weather that robbed me of that last backward look so close to the heart of the departing traveler. We ran into rough water sooner than anyone expected and a rather devastating toll of seasickness resulted. I weathered the pitching and rolling a bit longer than most, but eventually, oh, horrible feeling, I too succumbed. My head, my stomach. The siege is considerably abated now though. So all hands are feeling much more chipper about life in general. For my part, I've managed to retain four consecutive meals. Not a bad score, I think. Don't think I'll ever make much of a sailor though. Cheers, Anton. June 6th, 1944, England. Dear mom and pop, oops, excuse me. Dear mom and pop, I'm feeling a little tired and kind of fed up. So I'm just gonna say a quick hello and then good night. That's a pretty auspicious date up in the top right-hand corner, D-Day. We were out on a training exercise this morning when an old duffer walked through the field we were occupying to tell us that the invasion had begun. Excitement ran high for a while, but it's tapering off. The British are taking it all very much in their stride, 
And to all outward appearances, it might be just an ordinary Tuesday. The air activity has increased, of course. And for hours at a time, the sky will be filled with the drone of planes. I woke up this morning for Reveille to the roar of the big four motor jobs going over with their loads. And a guard told me they'd been going over since three in the morning. It's a great day, but oddly, quite unexciting to me. I really can't get too happy about it. I can't discuss our part in the thing, of course, that is when we might get into it, but I can say that I'm quite undisturbed by it. As yet, I have only one death to die, even if it comes to that. I'm, I'm not trying to be grim here, just trying to acquaint you with my feelings. Not a hell of a lot of point beating around the bush, is there? If we do get into it, I'll undoubtedly be scared half to death for a while, but I'm confident of an ability to overcome that. So have some faith in me. Don't worry about me unnecessarily. You'll do that anyway, I know, regardless of my pleadings to the contrary, and lay in a hell of a big supply of rye. Good night, Anton. P.S. The only package I've gotten is the one with the two boxes of chocolates. Could you start another one on the way? Candy, gum, lifesavers. July 27th, 1944, France. Dear mom and pop, We've been over here for a while now, and I've had ample opportunity to write, but I haven't done so for reasons that I can't fully explain. Suffice it to say that there are many things whose recording would be pointless because any record would be so inadequate. So far, we've done nothing but take a boat ride to France. I've been to Cherbourg. You will have read about what happened there. It's depressing to see a place so beat up. Everything, everywhere around here is beat up. TNT is a terrible destroyer, and there's a monotonous sameness to the look of all ruined buildings. In this hedgerow country, where observation is limited to a few hundred yards, almost every artillery officer has to act as a forward observer a task second only to that of the infantry. We say that the job separates the men from the boys. And soon, very soon, I'll have the opportunity of determining my own particular slot. So perhaps you can understand why I've not written. There are times in a person's life, it seems, when a little mental wrestling just has to be done and that wrestling just can't be shared with people 3,000 miles away. Try and understand that, will you? But let me set you straight, lest you become alarmed at my maunderings. My health is excellent, I'm eating and sleeping well, and I can still see a joke at every turn in the road. Pop's operation seems to have cleared up an old ill, and the news of his progress sure is cheering. I was beginning to wonder what the hell was going on, not having heard from you for so long. But as long as everything's okay, you are all forgiven. I'm tired and I gotta get some sleep. The end is in sight, dear people. Until then, for complete details, see your local newspaper. They know much more about this war than we who are fighting it. Good night, Anton. The next letter is in several sections with different dates on them and was clearly written at different times over a period of approximately two and a half weeks. August 1st, 1944, France. Dear mom and pop, we got into this mess a few days ago. And since then life has been so eventful, it's hard to know where to start just a weird kaleidoscope of strange sights and strange thoughts, the fancy part of which you will have seen in the newspapers and heard on the radio. 
Our part of the war has been damn crazy so far. I was just floating around one town right after the does, the infantry, had gone through it. And I saw a bunch of sweaty, cursing, harassed-looking MPs and a, oops, we're moving out. Continued later. August 10th. What I started to tell you about was how our recon sergeant, Jerry Cura, and I helped the MPs to search prisoners in a town right after it had been liberated. My first close contact with the super race army. It was really pretty funny. Everybody excited as hell. The prisoners surrendering faster than we could search them. The MPs yelling and cursing at the prisoners because they didn't respond quickly enough to orders given in a language that they couldn't understand. And all the while, the frogs are ringing the bells and passing out calvados and hollering, vive les Amériques, and stuff like that. Jesus, what a picture. August 16th. If the Heinies will just be quiet for a little while, not very likely that, I'll try and straighten you out about a few things. We've been in this about a month now, a month that seems like an eternity. Sometimes I feel like I've never been anywhere else but here in France, tangling with Jerry. Our part of the war so far has been a peculiar one. At first, it was a big old picnic, liberating about 10 French towns a day and everybody having a big time doing it. Then everything changed. We ran into some Germans. And for a while, every day was like a repetition of the day before. Sometime during the day or night, they'd lash out and snap at us. Somebody would get hurt, but we kept driving on until finally we had to stop. Then they slugged at us. We slugged back at them a little harder, I think. And for now, the thing is pretty much settled down. About the big picture, I couldn't say very much, <laughs> even if I knew anything about it. I've been fighting what John Steinbeck calls Ernie Pyle's war, as differentiated from General Marshall's war, real close and intimate like. I'm not saying that to bother you. The chaplains say we should chat about the weather, etc., but when you're right in the middle of this stuff, it's kind of stupid not to talk about it. Maybe you don't understand, but right now, this war is my life. Even sitting down to write a letter seems like a crazy contradiction, like a gay joke between me and me. I've seen more than anyone else in the battery since we've been over here. I've spent a great deal of time with the does and oddly enough, I'm kind of glad that I have. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that the does are the only ones who do any real soldiering. Sure, a battery position can get rough when the 88s, the German artillery, open up on it. But after a session with the infantry, going back to our battery area is like going to a rest camp. And some of our gang have the colossal bloody gall to gripe. Would that I could transfer him to the infantry for a week and show him what the hell a real war is like. Oops. A couple of the boys, Jerry Cura, a hell of a good boy from Boston, and a rough looking little harp who drives our Jeep, Murphy, We've had some experiences together that I won't forget for a good long time. I've been scared, really trembling scared, just once. That was when the three of us were laying wire through a town and a goddamn 88 came looping at us so close I thought the son of a bitch was going down my throat. We hit the gutter and she burst a hundred yards away. Maybe it was being in an enclosed space because two or three rounds have come closer to me than that one. But for some reason, that particular round really made me sweat. It wasn't the only time I've been scared, 
but it was the only time I felt an almost overpowering urge to get up and run like hell. The demonstrations in the villages bring mixed feelings. Cheering, flower-tossing crowds line the streets. And if you dared stop for even a moment, they'd mob you and the whole column would have to stop. Squads of the free French resistance fighters form and present arms as we go by. And one time an over jubilant bunch of them with some captured Heine rifles started jumping up and down, hollering, vive les Amériques and firing the damn rifles in the air. But then you see an old couple by the side of the road, all choked up with the tears running down their faces waving a homemade American flag that hasn't got the proper number of stars on it. And you say to yourself, what is the matter with people that they've got to treat each other like animals? Jesus, or somebody, why is that? If all this seems really confused, remember that I'm part of a big confusion over here and have patience with me. Say hello to Mac and Elsa and apologize for me not writing. Also to Elmer and anyone else I should be writing to. And don't worry about me. Every day I get more and more used to this racket and I'm getting to be pretty good at evaluating a risk. I'm being cautious and careful and I can take care of myself pretty well, as I've told you before. Good night, Anton. Western Union, Telegram, Government, Washington, D.C. To Arnold A. Pritchard, 36 Wellesley Avenue, North Providence, Rhode Island. Regret to inform you your son was seriously wounded in action, 22nd August in France. Until new address is received, address mail for him, quote, First Lieutenant Anton A. Pritchard, serial number, hospitalized, Central Postal Directory, Army Post Office 640, Care of Postmaster, New York, New York, unquote. You will be advised as reports of condition are received. J. A. Ulio, Adjutant General. September 4th, 1944, England. Dear mom and pop, you'll be getting some cock and bull story about me soon. So I'm just gonna scribble a quick line to set your minds at ease, if that's possible. I was wounded a few days ago. A fragment of a mortar shell pierced my left thigh and severed the femoral vein. Plasma, whole blood, and some of the modern drugs fixed everything up, and I've been evacuated to England to complete the recovery. Briefly, that's it. Now, I've always been frank with you, haven't I? Okay. So please believe me when I tell you that I'm perfectly okay. My general physical security is untouched and in a week, I won't even know that this happened. But don't get too excited if you don't get another letter in the next day's mail. I'm feeling kind of tired and not in much of a letter writing mood. So take it easy folks. And remember, like the man says, it can't last much longer. Cheers, Anton. About 40 years later, my father and I were standing on the lawn of the house in Versher, Vermont, on one of those beautiful, calm summer evenings that Vermont specializes in. I have no memory of how we got onto the topic of how we had been wounded, but I remember quite well what he said about it, and it was about like this. I was with a patrol of the infantry. I was there to call in the artillery support in case they needed it. We were getting close to where we thought the German front line was. And I went into a field by the side of the road to look around. And that, that put a tall hedge between me and the infantry guys. Then I heard a German mortar fire. 
it was easy to tell what it was. A German mortar sounded like a loud cough, very different from anything else you heard. And I saw the shell burst on the far side of the field. And I felt a sudden sharp pain in my leg. And I looked down and the blood was gushing out. I reached up with both hands to the top of the hedge, pulled myself up and rolled across the top of the hedge. The last thing I remember before passing out is seeing the ground coming up at me as I fell. Fortunately, I landed near an infantryman who had been paying attention in first aid training. He got a tourniquet around my leg right away, stopped the bleeding, and may well have saved my life. I woke up in the medical evacuation tent. My father spent about three months in England recovering from that wound. His letters from that period make it very clear that life as a patient in England was much easier than life in the field with his unit. But we'll pick up the story again as he's on his way back to the front. December 6th, 1944, France. Dear mom and pop, Yesterday, I arrived at the forward-most depot in the replacement setup. From here, I go to the division, probably tomorrow or the next day. So, I'm to go back into it again. This time, though, the complexion is considerably different. The fighting is harder. It's day by day inching slogging through carefully planned defenses. Now the charts begin to show a rise in the psychological crack-up department. I blew my top, people will say. Last time they called it shell shock, but the effects are very much the same. We've lost two officers in the battalion that way in the last couple weeks. Always I've been frank with you. And I don't need to tell you it's rough. You're intelligent people and you understand that. But at the same time, I don't want you to worry unnecessarily about my welfare. That doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense, does it? Maybe telling you that we're repairing lawnmowers in sunny France would be best after all. But do keep this in mind. Every day I become a better soldier and more able to take care of myself. That's the only antidote that I can realistically offer against worry. And one more thing, remember that in the rain and the mud, writing has its physical difficulties, even if your heart is in it. So don't be alarmed if you don't hear from me for a while. Good night, Anton. December 16th, 1944, France, dear mom and pop. Every great change has a profound impact on me and the results of this latest maneuver are now being felt. It's always the same. I become quiet, morose, sleep fitfully and have little interest in communicating with anyone. The fit passes with time, however as I regain a grip on my mental health. My return to the outfit was heralded by a warm welcome that did my heart good. This is the only part of army life that's attractive to me. Good companionship of the kind that comes from dangers shared and privations endured is an experience completely alien to civilian life. The stories of battles fought in my absence have been told over twice now, and colored by schnapps and the teller's imagination, they make very interesting listening. As observation posts go, this latest is the most novel. We've been occupying a house separated from the Krauts by a natural barrier about a hundred yards wide. And from our vantage point in the attic, 
we've watched three cool cookies over on the German side stroll around with no apparent regard for the fact that they were being observed at close range. Of course, if activity centered around any particular building, I'd fire on it, but that didn't seem to disturb them very much. The most foolish part of this OP, however, is that we're sharing the building with civilians. After some haggling with our mess sergeant, I donated some food to the lady of the house, and in return, she had agreed to cook us two meals a day. And believe me, it is an odd sensation to be scolded from the landing of the stairs for not coming down to dinner. Here I am shooting at Krauts and someone's telling me my dinner's getting cold. <laughs> what a hell of a war. One incident at this OP illustrates the casual attitude that we cultivate towards destruction of all kinds. Late one afternoon, one of the Army's combat photographers found his way to our attic hideout and requested our cooperation in obtaining some shots of the resultant action of artillery shells. I said to him, what do you mean by this phrase resultant action, Sergeant? You mean you want to see some houses blown up? That's it, he grinned. After a decision had been reached about which building's destruction would best serve his purposes, we ripped the walls and tore the roof until he had sufficient footage. Great stuff, hey? Seriously. I doubt that one of the gleeful does who witnessed this spectacle gave a thought to the fact that it was someone's home we were tearing apart. The photographer departed after thanking me profusely for our assistance. These are the best shots I've ever gotten, he said. Although it's been little more than a month, already the happy good time that I had in England has become part of the distant past. The trips to London and the carefree days in Bournemouth have lost none of their vividness, but they happened so long ago. Good night, Anton. February 3rd, 1945, Luxembourg. Dear mom and pop, if I don't write for a prolonged period, it becomes harder and harder to pick up the pen and start, and the longer I procrastinate, the harder it becomes to make a beginning. Further, we've been so busy lately with the damn krauts that connected thought has been impossible. Ever present, too, is the problem of writing to people who have no close contact with the war. I've spoken often of this, I know, so often that perhaps you think I regard you as travelers so distant that you cannot comprehend anything that goes on. But when I tell you that even the men in the battery, three or 4,000 yards behind the front, have very little idea what the actual fighting is like, perhaps you'll understand my attitude. It's hard to believe, I know. I've talked myself foolish trying to persuade them how easy their lives are compared to the true frontline soldier, but they don't understand. I've put up for months with their whining about the cold and the snow and all the physical and spiritual hardships attendant on this lousy mess. But one of these times I may just lose control and punch one of them in the face and walk away without a word. It's really a struggle between the animal and whatever good there is in men, this business of fighting. And the closer you get to the point where one guy points his rifle at another guy and pulls the trigger, the more violent the struggle becomes and the harder it is to preserve even a trifle of human decency and dignity. But it is there, no matter how rough the going. Most often, I believe, it is involuntary. A case in point, Several times I've had to stop myself from helping wounded men. I have stopped to help several times when I shouldn't have, at the cost of my own men and the infantry whom we happen to be supporting. A specific instance, one afternoon, not long ago, 
we came into a place right after I'd prepared it with a few volleys and the 47s, the fighter bombers had worked it over a little bit. Everywhere there were buildings burning. The GIs were clearing out houses, rifle and machine gun fire all over the place. Then just as we were about through this inferno, the crowds started to shell. It was just a little place, so they could pinpoint it and really pour it on. I was by the company commander's side, moving from one bit of shelter to the next, when we passed a barn, burning, timbers falling, hay burning, with a hell of a smoke and smell. And inside that barn were three horses, chained, shifting restlessly as the fire singed their hides. One at a time, I unchained those horses and led them out of the barn. And what for? They weren't my horses, and I'm no great animal lover. And besides that, there were more important things to do. I wouldn't tell anyone of such a thing because they might not understand. Nevertheless, please believe me when I tell you that for myself at least, such actions are completely spontaneous and unpremeditated. That's not what I wanted to say at all, but there it is. In all this, there do seem to be occasional beams of hope and cleanliness. I lately experienced the healing warmth of one of these beams. An axle broke on a truck that was transporting me through the city of Luxembourg and sheer good fortune led me to knock on the door of some people I could call friend. I spent two nights and the intervening day with these very good people, the Spiracle family. How good to sit in a lighted room, listening to the radio, talking with intelligent people, and then going to bed between clean white sheets. My only problem was slowing down their constant stream of hospitality. They kept wanting to do something for me. I hope I can see them again. Good night, Anton. February 18th, 1945, Luxembourg. Dear mom and pop, in my last letter, I promised to tell you how I came to be awarded the Bronze Star. Well, I just finished writing to Leon about it and the story's getting a little stale in the telling. So I'll be brief this time if you don't mind. It was some time ago when we were fighting up around Bastogne. And one day I found myself in the woods ahead of town working with Company C of the infantry. My crew consisted of two men, a sergeant and a PFC, a private first class. Both of them were new to the crew. We had no very definite objective, just to clear the stretch of woods in front of us. We joined the does, the infantry, and began pushing forward. Almost simultaneously, the woods became a crashing, roaring bedlam, full of mortars and artillery shells and goddamn krauts with schmiesers and machine guns. Slowly, we pushed forward, my two buckos becoming more and more reluctant to move with each stage until I was spending most of my time prying them out of holes. The day finally ended somehow and the three of us fell back about 500 yards from the front line to spend the night in the cellar of an old house in the middle of the woods. Some indication of what the next day would bring came after we'd been in the cellar a few minutes. The two men were talking about what a rough day it had been. And the sergeant turned to me and said, I'm not going out tomorrow, Lieutenant. I just can't take another day like today. I figured he was pretty tired and didn't know what he was saying. So I told him to get some sleep. And I followed that up with a little pep talk, which I didn't really believe myself. 
The next dawn, I arose, cold and wet and still half asleep. I went to see the Doe Company commander about late plans. Then I went back to the house for my two men and the radio. I stood at the top of the cellar steps and called down. All right, boys, time to move out, let's go. No answer came from the blackness at my feet. So I repeated my call and back came a sullen muttered, I'm not going from the sergeant. Let's cut out this damn foolishness, I said. We've got to get going now, let's go. A pause and again, I'm not going. I tried once more. Do you know what you're saying, Sergeant? Do you understand what those words mean? Again, I'm not going. So I tried the other guy with equally unsuccessful results. Never have I felt so angry and so helpless. It had never entered my mind that a time would come when somebody would just flatly quit on me. With my old crew, this never would have happened. Nothing could be done, of course, but to take the radio and go out alone, which I did. And I lugged that damn radio through the snow all day until I was about ready to drop the thing in the snow and give the whole damn business up. So that, substantially, is the story. Like I said to Leon, two men quit on me and so I get a bronze star? Some farce, hey? Good night, Anton. P.S. I just got a Christmas card from the North Providence Service Men's Mothers Club. Jesus. March 12th, 1945, Germany. Dear mom and pop, maybe now you understand why I don't write as often as I should. You speak of a letter that I wrote to Elsa back in January and the troubled tone of that letter. Now that the incident is well in the past, I can look back on it much more calmly than I could at the time of writing. Never have I experienced a session such as we went through at Bastogne. Remember, I had only recently gotten back from the lovely haven of England when that Holocaust broke loose. The weather was insufferable. Great heavy snows, almost paralyzing cold, nine, 10 degrees above zero. So the day and night we were never warm. And that combined with combat excitement almost caused some of us to lose control of our kidneys. Through this, we fought and we fought very hard. Through the endless woods of the Ardennes, we crawled through the hip deep snow. With all our heavy clothing and all the impedimenta of 20th century war making. And it was during this time that two of my men heaved in the sponge, forcing me to go it alone. But, and this is the only compensating factor. We kicked out the damn krauts. We fought them almost man for man and we kicked the sons of bitches out. Maybe that's nothing very lofty to be proud of. But right now I'm a soldier and about all I have to be proud of is being part of some good soldiering. And believe me, that was pretty good soldiering. But maybe now you can understand why the letter to Elsa was not very cheerful. Now that I got that off my chest, I can move on to cheerier topics. Recently, my crew and I were assigned to liaison duty for a few days, which due to the nature of operations at the time, turned out to be a, a 24 carat snap. We just loafed around, ate well for a change, and did practically nothing. Very good. Best of all, though, I'm now back in a position that I left or was kicked out of almost two years ago at Camp Cook, battery executive officer, second in command of the battery. More about that later. Cheers, Anton.
April 8th, 1945, Germany. Dear mom and pop, of course you know I haven't written. The newspapers will have given you the reason. If that sounds smugly self-satisfied, it's because the statement can be made in no other way. We make the headlines, as the boys say. And there you have it. Seriously, this has been our wildest, weirdest, wooliest rat race to date. Right now, the Krauts are in a hell of a state of confusion, and that helps keep our casualties low and makes it pretty easy to get around. About all the top brass have to do now is decide which towns we should go through, and we go through them. This, however, is very hard on men and machines. Three days and nights with no sleep and very little food takes its toll on the human body. Eyes become bloodshot, tempers become short, and your mind won't serve you for five consecutive minutes. I have to write things down to remember them. Adding to the confusion for me is that I inherited command of the battery a few days ago when our battery commander, Captain Jameson, got his foot run over by a truck during a night march. Yes, your son is now commanding good old Battery A. To describe all the crazy little incidents that you're bound to witness when you overrun an enemy position and go tearing into his rear would take far more time than I have available tonight. Use your imaginations and you'll get a pretty grand idea. Just imagine the reaction in exchange place in Providence if Kraut tanks came roaring down Westminster Street with guns blazing. Everywhere there's emotion, most of it very mixed. Old men wave, young girls weep, young girls wave, old men weep. And everywhere there's excitement, just crazy rushing excitement that doesn't go anywhere, but just rushes. Along the way, we've released thousands, yes, actually, thousands of forced laborers. Slaves is what they are. And this throng adds the strongest note of tragedy to the picture. We've seen streams of them along our routes of advance. Men, women, and children, so beaten they just stare at the ground as they plod past us. Worst of all are the Russians. What has been done to those people? We went through one town a little while ago that I won't forget for a good long time. In the center, we had to go up a very narrow street, buildings burning on both sides, a regular furnace that had me worried about our gasoline cans and our ammunition. Then on the far side were women and girls. Their sweaty, singed hair plastered to their foreheads, dodging between our pounding vehicles with inadequate buckets of water to throw on the inferno that used to be home to try and slow down the crackle a little. They look at us, frightened and animal-like, trying to read the answer to the question of whether we'd stop to let them pass with their pitiful pails or whether if they left the safety of the curb, they'd be run down. It only took us a scant few minutes to dash through, but it'll be a while before I forget that town. You can see from the lack of organization here that I just picked up the pen and raced along for a while. Would that I had another two or three hours because there's lots more that I'd like to tell you, but that'll have to wait. Good night. Anton. On April 30th, 1945, Adolf Hitler shot himself in his underground bunker in Berlin as the Soviet army was closing in on him over the rubble of the city. A few days later on May 8th, what was left of the German government officially surrendered to the Allies. So this last letter that we're going to look at 
was written shortly after the end of the war in Europe. But the war in the Pacific against Japan was still going on. June 2nd, 1945, Weimar, Germany. Dear mom and pop, yes, I know I haven't written. So much has been happening, it's impossible to record it all. Right now, my battery's function consists of policing an area near Weimar. If you want to know what that really means I'm supposed to be doing, all I can say is when I find out, I'll tell you. Here, everything revolves in a dizzy whirlpool that's hard to resolve into much sense. Europe is sick, very, very sick, and the festering sores are very apparent. I wish I could describe that it's the scenes that are to be seen each day by the side of the Autobahn that cuts through the middle of this lovely Thuringian countryside. Poles, Italians, Frenchmen, Russians, and lately thousands of bedraggled Kraut soldiers make up the parade that is to be seen each day by the side of this great highway. On bicycles, some travel. A few on motorcycles or in rickety looking trucks, but the great, great mass are on foot with their few belongings on their backs or in weird vehicles pulled in the main by human power. What a scene, oh, what a scene. In the near future, you may be visited by some of my very good friends. Some men have begun to leave the battery for home and discharge. One of them is Ronald Wynn Stanley, who lives over on Mineral Spring Avenue. Another is a tough little Irishman possessed of many guts and a fine sense of duty, who drove our Jeep and carried our radio through many a warm session. Name of Murphy. These are good men, these. I know I don't have to ask you to make them welcome. All these leave takings are just the beginning of the mess that I expect will follow. I really inherited command of the battery at the worst time. Men whom I've trained with, drunk with, paraded with, fought with. And now I get the thing just as they start to break it up. I'm tired and I gotta get some sleep. So many thoughts crowd into my timid mind that it's hard to bring much order to the telling. So I'll quit for the night. I've really got to think about what to do next with myself. If I just let things float along, I may find myself on a boat headed for the Pacific, a prospect that does not appeal to me. For my part, I have had enough, all I want. But I will say this while it's on my mind. Rough as the going has often been, and homesick and lonely as I have often felt, I wouldn't trade the last year for the richest prize the world can offer. Of that, I'm sure. Good night, Anton. And my father, before he returned home, actually spent two years still in Europe working with displaced persons and refugees while working for the United Nations. Uh, and if he had not done that, I wouldn't be here talking to you because that's how he met my mother. But that is another story. So this aspect of his story, we will now bring to a close and thank you all for your attention. And it's back over to Heather, I believe. Heather, you got to unmute yourself. <laughs> there we go. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> it takes me a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Arnie. This was a really interesting uh, presentation. And I, I really found your father's voice so fascinating and really um, very, you could really get a sense for what was going on through his voice. Yeah, well, that's, that's the whole point. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, we we have a comment here. Okay. Uh, Robert Ber Bergner says, thanks, Arnie. That was great. And Jeff Smith says, wonderful letters, wonderful reader. Um, Madeline says, beautifully told and lots okay. of emotion in the telling. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, you are welcome to unmute at this time. Yes, there. this usually does arouse some questions. How did you yeah. Which, uh, letters to I'm sorry, Beth, can you please, uh, we can't hear you very well. Can you turn your volume up? How did you choose which letters to include? Uh, it sounds like you had a lot more than what you were able to read to us in this time yeah. period. Okay, just, just for the record, I wasn't reading. Uh, this wasn't, ev this isn't normally evident, but uh, this is storytelling. It's, it's not, uh, not reading. Um, Sorry, but that's an ideological point in the storytelling world a little bit. Um, how did I choose which letters? Um, it was really just what I thought would go together best to make a compelling narrative. Um, and I tried to avoid repetition. I tried to, at least too much of it, I tried to um, cut out stuff that was sort of interesting, but not really on the main track, and stuff that required too much prior knowledge, like if he talks in detail about family business, obviously the people he was writing to knew all about that, but people in uh, New England in 2021 don't know all about it. So um, that part basically got cut out, but really there's no great mystery to it. And I did actually, it is not an accident that I focus on the time when he's overseas and in fighting, because that's obviously the most dramatic there is a lot of very interesting stuff in his other letters from before he went overseas and afterwards working for UNRWA that is extremely interesting historically, but harder to put into a harder to put into one connected story that comes over orally in a compelling way. So that more or less accounts for that. Thank you. I'm curious. Um, was your grandfather in World War I? No, he was not. He, um, my grandparents actually immigrated from England to Rhode Island in 1911. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1885, which would have put him slightly on the old side to be among the first drafted in World War I. Um, he, he was an Amer he, he had just barely, be actually, he became an American citizen during World War I. But uh, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. So, some of my relatives on uh, the other side of the family were, but uh, not, um, not my grandfather. I was wondering if, if because your, your, um, your father's letters, I was just wondering if he was writing to somebody who understood war, if not someone yeah. who had been directly involved, no. Yeah. And, and, and that comes across in some of his letters because you could tell particularly in that letter where he talks about, um, about leading the horses out of the barn. You know, he talks at the beginning about, um, about how one of his major problems is writing to people who have no close contact with the war. Yeah. And this, if you read even memoirs by other soldiers who were written, who are soldiers or Marines or whoever in the war, that is a problem that they almost feel, feel like a kind of psychological or spiritual barrier has come down between them and the people who have literally never been in combat. Sometimes that barrier even came down between troops who had been in combat and troops whose responsibilities were in the rear area who were doing important things, but were not in the kind of danger and didn't really have to go through quite the level of privation that the troops in the front line did. And that, that is one of the things about, one of the most striking things about all these letters is that he's constantly struggling with two contradictory impulses. There's the the desire, he really wants his parents to understand as much as they can what he's going through. He really wants to be understood. On the other hand, he doesn't want to scare the living daylights mm -hmm. out of them. And you can see him sometimes even in the same paragraph, he'll kind of veer one way and then veer the other way. But anyway, I see a question in the comments about, um, gosh, I lost it as the comments moved on. Uh, 
actually several questions. Um, yeah, would you like me to read them? Okay, let me, well, let me go through them. Here's, were those photos your dad's or were they file photos? Most of them, some of them I really don't know. I think most of them were probably taken by other people because a lot of them show up in the, um, in the battalion uh, history. And there's actually a note in the battalion history that says that there was one, one other officer who took a lot of the photographs. But that's pro a probable, it's not a certainty. Um, okay, further questions, I'll scroll down here. Uh, okay, what happened to the two soldiers who refused to go out to the field next morning? Yeah. The short answer is, I don't know. He never mentions what happened to them. And since he never mentions their names, it would probably be difficult to trace. Um, I will say that it was rare, extremely rare for American troops to be court-martialed for this kind of offense or anything like that. There's actually a very good book by Ben Shepard called uh, The War of Nerves, which is about basically psychiatry and the military during the 20th century. Um, and soldiers who broke down in combat, which an awful lot did, and eventually the army got to its got to just accept the fact that this was going to happen, that everybody has their breaking point. Um, quite a few actually were returned to combat eventually after some treatment mm -hmm. and some never were, uh, some were punished. And actually one interesting thing about that whole incident, I think that incident is pretty clearly the sort of spiritual low point of this whole story. That's when he really bottoms out. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of indications there. Like when he says, I gave them a little pep talk, which I didn't really believe myself. And then at the end, when he talks about lugging the radio through the snow until I was about ready to drop the thing in the snow and give the whole damn business up. I think at some level, he kind of recognizes that he wasn't that far away from where these guys were in some ways. Um, today, of course, we call all this PTSD, but I don't think the term had been invented yet. Other questions? Have you spotted it? Do you have any letters from his family back to him? Okay, pardon me if I'm sort of taking over. I'm just scrolling down and I'm seeing this. Um, I have a lot of letters from not only my grandparents, but from lots of other people to my father. However, the period of the story, of most of the story, basically that stops. Uh, the letters from the time he crossed to France, from England to France, and basically I haven't found any letters in the trunk starting on that date. They pick a gut up again after the war ends, but there's a whole long section which basically corresponds with the story where the letters are lost. I don't know what happened to them. I can guess that was by far the most unstable period. I know obviously there were letters because he, well, first of all, it would be crazy to think they wouldn't write to him. And second, he, as you may have noticed in some letters to his parents, he refers to things that they had said in letters that they wrote to him. So they did write letters, but those letters unfortunately are lost. And people sometimes say they'd, they'd like to hear my grandparents' voices in this story to which the only answer I can give is yes, so would I. But unfortunately, those are uh, those voices are seem to be gone. Um, anything else? Okay, I think I may be missing something in the chat. If so, I apologize. But you don't have to put a question in the chat. If anyone has a question or any comment or anything they'd like to just uh, raise, I think Nan Nancy. I I can't see everybody, by the way, so. You may have to unmute yourself, but I do see Nancy. So if you have to go ahead. Well, I've been most interested in hearing all of this because um, uh, my siblings and I are busy working on a pandemic project of going through our great uncle's World War I letters. Ha. Huh. And he, yeah, as soon as he got over on the continent, um, you have to carry everything with you. So there's no way you can hang on to uh, a lot of those care packages. You share them with your unit. Yeah. 
the letters, he would read them over several times, but then they would have to move to another billet, so he would burn them. So, yeah, you know, there's so. none of those letters. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 you can understand. Sometimes I'm surprised how much paperwork from that period in combat survives. Well, we read an interesting article. I can't remember if it was through Wikipedia or whatever, um, uh, an account of a fellow who worked in the postal, the Great Britain postal s system, and uh, they realized that um, they really needed to keep the mail flowing back and forth. Uh, it was very important for morale and everything. So 12 million p letters per week. And wow. I can't remember the, the tonnage of parcels. Yikes. But it's incredible. Um, this young fellow, how many letters and care packages he got constantly. Huh. Yes. Actually, there's uh, one of the more interesting I did once I've done, as you would guess, a lot of reading about World War II for, for this. And um, one interesting factoid, there was an interview with um, with the, actually, it's a, a very interesting, a Women's Army Corps major, and not only that, but African-American who was in charge of the major mail sorting facility in England. And God knows how that happened, can you say, considering the general practices of the time. But one thing she said to indicate how difficult it was sometimes if people didn't get the address right, right or get the serial number or the unit, she said that in the US forces in the European theater, there were approximately 7,000 different individuals named Robert Smith. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that, so if you just wrote to Robert Smith, US Army Europe, good luck at ever getting to the right person. But uh, yeah, it was huge. Well, in World yeah. War I, apparently, well, in London, um, the Postal Service took over Regent's Park and had tents and everything, and they had in incredible mailbags. Oh, boy. Um, and yeah. they not only delivered the mail to the front and then the soldiers' letters back home, but if they could not deliver a piece of mail, they would return it to the sender. Back huh. And, uh, you know, with yeah, the great number of casualties it. there were, uh, there was a lot of mail being returned to sender. Oh, yes. One of the more heartbreaking episodes that I've read about was, it's in a great book, The Men of Company K, which was written by a couple of about a couple of people who'd been in this one fairly typical infantry unit. The first time the unit went into combat, the company went into combat, they had heavy casualties and they came out, out of the line for arrest. And the company clerk had a lot of mail um, addressed to all the troops and they had a meeting and he got up on some kind of platform in front of them and was reading off the names on the mail and the men would come and of course, a lot of names no one answered to. And about halfway through, the guy just broke down in tears and somebody else had to take over the job. Bev, did you Any have other? a question? Um, yeah, more, more a comment, I guess. Um, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah. I am fortunate that I have all of my dad's letters from the Second World War. And huh. I also, also have his brother's letters that were sent to his mother, including ones from a POW camp and the letters back from their mother to uh, my dad in particular. And interestingly, from the time he went overseas, every letter he sent home, he numbered so that huh. if any of them went missing, his family would know that huh. they were missing. Um, and you mentioned about people with the same name he received uh, mail addressed to a Ronald Place, which was his name, but it wasn't to him. And he actually managed to track down the other soldier who had the same name, huh. to see that the letter got delivered. And he was kind of interested in genealogy, so he always hoped to pursue that a little further and find out if there was any connection. But I don't think he had any success with that. Mm. Okay. Did anyone else have any questions? Yeah, re remembering that I, we can't see everybody at once. So you may have to unmute yourself and talk, speak up <laughs> if you have a question. Hmm. 
All right. Well, Arnie, okay. I would like to thank you very much for this okay. really interesting presentation. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, everybody, for participating. And uh, we will hopefully see you at one of our other presentations. Yep. There's a lot of good ones that the library has. I checked. I looked, I looked at a couple of them. Thank you. So. <laughs> thank you so much, Arnie. This has been really very interesting. Oh, thank you. Good night, everyone.